This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. This is Everything Elite, the world's best podcast devoted exclusively to all elite wrestling and the elite extended universe. I'm Aaron Bentley, and I've already lost the thread of who... Okay, I think I went Nate last week. I think you're right. I think so. So I'm also joined by Iron Mike Spears. What's up, Mike? Hey, y'all. It's your old pal, Iron Mike Spears. Uh, You know, everything's happening all the time. That's all I've got. Yeah, I get. Well, I guess we'll just hit this off the top. So yeah, that, it, it feels a little. Haven't... It felt a little disingenuous for me to do like my usual spiel, like going straight in. So yeah, but I, I haven't introduced Nate yet. So we'll, yeah. we'll just Nate. Maybe we'll tag in uh, after we talk about this. But we'll hi see. everyone. Oh, there's Nate. Nate's there's Nate. here. So a lot going on today. A lot of uh, talk on Twitter about accusations of abuse in many forms from wrestlers include, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse. And that does include a couple of allegations against uh, people who work for AEW. And I say a couple as we're recording this. So obviously more could come out. Uh, And in fact, a lot has come out already. So you couldn't be surprised at this point to see much more. And from our perspective, I guess we would just want to say that we hope AEW especially, since that's what we talk about on this show, will take this very seriously, uh, believe victims, and um, not just believe them, but do things, take action in ways that honors uh, the fact that not only that victims have gone through what they have, but that they also had the, well, I want to say strength and courage to speak out, but I don't want to imply that you're not strong or not courageous if you can't talk out, speak out about uh, abuse that you've gone through. So just want to say that we, you know, our, our thoughts are with everyone who has uh, been telling their stories today and everyone who hasn't been able to tell their stories yet. And we hope that this can be weeded out as much as it can be from professional wrestling. Yeah. I don't really have anything to add. I think that, you know, as far as extemporaneous statements on very serious topics, I was, uh, pretty good um so yeah uh you know we obviously uh believe all these stories and uh you said it pretty much yeah i don't know there's this there's this whole battle about basically believing women until it's inconvenient for you to believe women and and victims uh, of all genders and uh, i just hope everybody will take this stuff seriously, even when it's against people that, uh, that you're fond of or that you like their work or you bullshit with them on Twitter sometimes or whatever. And just appreciate that, uh, the large majority of the time people don't just come out and say this stuff for fun. It's because it's, uh, because it's not a fun thing to do. I'm sure a lot of them are getting shitty, uh, Twitter replies and DMS and God knows what. So, uh, yeah, we just have to take it seriously. Stuff that the victims, uh, you know, is probably going to follow them for the rest of their lives that they came out and said this stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Nobody does it for fun. You know, it's not a, uh, a trifling thing or an easy thing. Uh, and for that reason, um, you have to respect it and you have to, uh, take it seriously. Yeah. And I, I guess the only thing that other than co-signing what you all have had said is there's a lot that have come out and i just hope that for everyone who has come out and talked about this and the ones that haven't that they did that they don't feel like that they've been mitigated or completely ignored because of if it's just a random trainer and a random indie that no one's ever heard of or if it's the biggest star in the world everyone's all the abuses should be uh, i'm trying to the right way to say this i'm terrible about this kind of thing uh 
it, it's something that it's still valid. It's, it's not, still valid, yeah. right? And you know, we, uh, you know, uh, acknowledge. You know, what's important is really the the individual victims suffering. I think, and that's what should be central to it. Right. Yes, and and as we talk about wrestling on this show, we will, uh, you know, just talk about wrestling, and when it becomes necessary to talk about these things, we absolutely will. Uh, so we just wanted to talk about that off the top, so that uh, everyone knew that we uh, we hear you, we believe you, and we stand with you uh, in whatever way we can. So that said, let's get into uh, the podcast. If you want to. Follow us or get in touch with us in any way. You can find us on Twitter at everything AEW. I'm at Aaron like the car. Nate is at Epitasis. Mike is at Fuji Heya. You can subscribe to the podcast by searching Everything Elite on the podcast app of your choice or subscribing to the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. If you're on the Apple Podcast app, we would appreciate a rating and review on there. And please check out uh, for bonus content, patreon.com slash everything elite. We'll tell you a little bit more later about what's on there right now. On the show tonight, we're going to play Elite or Delete. We're going to talk ratings, run down Dynamite, and I bet we'll talk about Ricky Starks signing to AEW. So those are a a few things that we're going to chat about. We'll start, as is customary, with Elite or Delete. Delete! Elite! Delete! Elite! Nate, your favorite thing from the show this week, honestly, on a show that I don't think is, I don't think this is divisive. I think everybody pretty much agreed it was a, a, a damn good show. Yeah, definitely thought it was a good show. Hard to pick out a single element that I thought was exceptional. It was just a very smooth, well-rounded show. Flowed nicely, easy to watch. I'm like halfway to doing what Mike did last week and just saying <laughs> the whole show was elite. It was all, but that is, yeah, what, what? I was going to say, this is why I made sure to have something on a show I really like. I already had one thing in mind written down so I'd talk about it so I wouldn't fall in that trap again. And now you're falling to what I did. Uh, yeah. So, it, you know, there's a, there is a, Elements of the show that is how well produced it is and how segments flow and are timed and go from one into the next. And, you know, this is something I've put over previously as far as like the live show when you're viewing it in the stadium or whatever, like you barely notice it's a televised show because the matches can do through the ad breaks and they have other things going on as far as segments during ad breaks and shit. Um, But that's not really what I want to talk about. What I mostly want to call out as lead on this show was doing one of my favorite angles um, or uh, swerves or mechanics or techniques that that you can do in wrestling, which is spent the whole show and really the whole week leading up to the show, pushing the wrestling return of Anna J on this dynamite. Very heavily pushed. Tony was all about it. Like, Hey, Anna J the draw is going to be on dynamite this week. Uh, and you know, uh, her first match on dynamite since she was, uh, signed to a actual contract here with AEW, uh, facing Abaddon. I think I got it this time. And I just did what is one of the things that amuses me most in wrestling, which is where they build somebody as a star. They push somebody as a star. They're like, Hey, here it comes. Check out this match. It's going to be a star showcase. Uh, and then she jobbed at Abaddon in like four minutes or something. Just amuses me every time makes me laugh and i think is also just effective one of those one of those little things you can do from time to time in wrestling that acts as money in the bank so that you can do faker things down the line you can be like oh no it's it's not a fake sport because look we were promoting this person as a star and they just happened to go out there and lose and just kind of makes it all seem a bit more credible um so that was my elite pick is is abaddon going over anna jay here yeah, I love the inversion of expectations. And it's such a cool thing to have like this and then picking like the right time to invert the expectations. And especially with something that, you know, whenever we've ever seen so and so is in action, at least in previews, we are led to believe that they're 99% or up until the time 
basically virtually are always going to be winning. And now we have the thing of, it just puts a little bit of thought in our mind and it makes things more interesting. I think that having Anna J lose and the stuff that's happened post-match. And I, I really like that as like an aspect of keeping your viewers and fans on your toes and not to be able to just be able to call shots before it happens. So I like that. It seemed so weird. I, I guess I should have seen it, something like this coming because it's like, why are we pushing the Anna J thing so hard? I kind of thought they've had so much attrition in the division. That's just, they're just going to have to push her. So that's just what we're getting. And that's what I expected basically until Abaddon won the match. So I, and I guess, again, I should have seen something coming when Abaddon had like a, uh, a fiend entrance, you know, she was truly jokerified right. as she, <laughs> as she entered. I should have known and effects and shit. Yeah. something else was happening, but we, we also found out after that Abaddon has also signed with AEW. It's just so it, it's one of those things that I like being able to go back and say, Oh, they were doing camera effects. So I should have known that this was something happened. I like having like that, like, Oh, I should have known like being tricked in like in a way that is not like disrespect the viewer. Like there's a lot of, insulting your viewer by tricking but this one was like a, oh okay now i know to keep myself on my toes you know I have eyes in the back of my head spears all right mike well you said you have written down one specific thing great tease so this <laughs> is a part of the show where we all pick a, a specific thing yeah so, so tell me what you picked I, and, and nate thanks for not going like way into the post-match stuff because that was the thing i found really interesting that was my elite pick was the whole thing of Colt Cabana and the Dark Order that has been going in the last two weeks and a little bit of a disappointment that they did not put this promo that he had with Alex Marvez on TV and they had it as like a post-show thing. It's something that, you know, I always have my frustrations about how they do the shoulder content and how they do the other stuff, but just how they've built this up and they've now have these multi-dimensional characters and specifically when I'm talking about Colt Cabana, he's someone who that, in this promo and getting the contract said, Hey, I came in here to be a wrestler. I've lost my major matches here. And I have to prove that I am completely like on the level. I have to prove that I am someone worthy of this. And, you know, the dark order, like what Brody Lee's doing at least has carried over. So should, so I need to, see if this is right for me. And it's just interesting. Like it's such like a good baby face promo. That's not a standard baby face promo. It's something that was, as soon as I saw it, I sent a message to AB and I was like, you have to see this thing immediately. And I knew it was past your bedtime, but I was like, this is something you have to watch right now. And just was like an incredible thing. And, and that plays in the whole entire dark quarter thing as well, because they didn't just do that at post-match. They also had came out, and they brought Anna Jay back to her feet and they walked her to the back. So we're getting a lot of like multidimensional aspects of people like this, like Dark Order. And it's something that I find very interesting. And it's one of those things that we don't have that much on major uh, North American wrestling. And I like having that kind of thing. And I thought that at least with like the aspects with Colt Cabana and the Dark Order and how that's playing out, I felt like that that was incredibly compelling. And it keeps my eye, it keeps me thinking about like, okay, how's this going to go next week? We're two weeks away from uh, Fighter Fest. What's going to happen there? So I thought this was just all in all rad. Yeah, I do like, you know, one of the things I previously liked about the Dark Order is they just give you a little bit of intrigue from week to week that makes you not know exactly what's happening or where somebody's head's at or something like that. Uh, they especially did it well in the uh, Dark Order and SCU feud where it was like, oh, is Christopher Daniels the higher power or whatever? Um, and, you know, they eventually played off that in the finish of the match and it all worked out as a well-booked storyline there. So yeah, just, you know, it, a little bit of intrigue where you maybe don't know what a, where a character's motivation is or what's going to happen next or, you know, who's on what side is always welcome in wrestling. And the dark order is good, especially because it lets some of those less important characters be vulnerable, which is important. Like you see some vulnerability from Colt, uh, like I've said, I want to see the best friends cry. I need them to cry and have their vulnerability on display there. Um, and that just, you know, gives the gives the audience an in to identify with the wrestlers more. This really plays into my elite pick, which is Tony, buddy. Glad you're listening. We appreciate it. Three stories in the women's division, folks. Three stories. We've got Anna Jay and the Dark Order. 
We've got Britt and Big Swole. They're carrying on this story, even though Britt is injured, which is good. And then, of course, the Sheeta Penelope story. Now, I may not like all those stories. I've been clear that I don't like the Sheeta Penelope Ford story. But we got three stories. Only one of them is over the title. And uh, that's good. So that makes me happy that things are expanding a little bit, even with a small women's roster. Yeah, and keeps getting smaller. Of course, they lost all the international talent, your Shanas and your Rihos and your Yukas. And now, of course, Chris Statlander tearing her ACL. So really down to, you know, a uh, 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 skeleton crew for the women. But it's good to see they're just given you a little bit to chew on with basically all the characters that they have on board. And they've managed to do this in a way that they all have different things in a very distinct storyline here. Like it'd be too easy. And I think it's something that, that, that they do a lot is they'll have people basically have the same storyline, especially like when it's like a title chase, like they do like having very similar things here, but you have a, you, you have a Britt Baker who has quickly gone from, okay, she's really funny to someone that might be best on interviews this year, just because of like how much he's gotten her character and how funny she is. And then big swole, just like that was brilliant stuff. And then you had Reba who's tremendous in this as well. Then you have like this very intriguing thing of like, where are they going to go with this new wrestler on the roster that was built up so much with Anna J and they have like, a, a title feud. And I think that's really interesting. It shows like a little bit of variety. And if anything shows that maybe like this is a skeleton crew, but maybe that there's a lot more flexibility within the roster and they're showing a lot of different range than I think a lot of us would have expected this time last year. And none of those three stories are about a man. They're not fighting about a man. They're not, there's nothing related to men involved. So that's also a, uh, a feather in the cap of, of one Mr. Tony Khan. All right. Well, we've all said that we really liked this episode. Frankly, I had a hard time picking out there were a few things I didn't like, but I didn't have a lot of things that I was just like, Ugh, that's, you know, that was awful. So what, what's your delete pick, Nate? Well, I basically said we were approaching the point at which I would no longer be able to complain about this because I would just have to accept that this is how they do things in AEW. And this is just a choice of the promotion that it's futile to complain about. But like you said, pretty strong episode, uh, extremely watchable. Really, this was maybe the only thing that graded on me. I've already complained that the best friends were set up as the number one contenders of the tag team titles two weeks ago. In the interim, Kenny Omega and Adam Page have had two title defenses. And on this show, their title defense opened the show. And then the match to determine the number one contenders again closed the show as the main event, which is just backwards. That's just a backwards thing to do. I understand why they did it. Uh, you know, number one, Chris Jericho, big star. They had him. They wanted to use him in a match. So you're going to put it in the main event. I guess that makes sense. They were going to beat him. So they wanted that to be the big thing. You know, that goes off the show is uh, having the best friends get a really big win, probably their biggest win to date. That makes sense. And of course, we've talked about, you know, with Kenny Omega and, uh, and Adam Page as well. They just want to do these big, work rate blow away matches and the first segment of the show. Tony Khan was on Twitter responding to Dave Meltzer saying, uh, you know, it, uh, that's a stated goal of his to put a really hot match on in the first segment of the show, because he wants that to stand up, uh, you know, against anything that the viewer might've come from. If Dave Meltzer was just watching news in Japan and then flips over to AEW, he doesn't want him to see, you know, Billy Gunn versus MJF on there and go, uh, oh, you know, this is just a, a different league of wrestling. I'm just not watching the same thing anymore. So that's why he does it. I get it. But it's backwards to have the title defended in the first show match on the show and then have a second <laughs> number one contenders match with the same team after two other teams have already challenged for the titles in the main event. Just that, you know, it logically doesn't make sense. And it's something that I would say that, like, not excusing it, there seems to be a lot of show formatting about caring about the top of the hour at eight, the top of the hour at nine, and then the show close thing. So like, it does feel like, okay, Jericho, we want to have Jericho on the show. Well, he has to go, he has to be on screen at 10 o'clock. Oh, Cody's on the show. Well, we're going to put him at nine o'clock. They like having Kenny Omega at eight. I think like he's probably opened more shows 
in this promotion than anyone else is either like him or the Bucks. So it does seem like there's a little bit of that going on with this as well. It, it, it's one of those things that I don't know. Like sometimes like the way that they've they've treated divisions and the way they've kind of treated like build up and how they invert it is not it, it kind of goes against uh what should happen like you said Nate. and it just means like makes you wonder why and i guess it's like, like he could say like he likes having like a hot match but like i look at these people that are in these segments and that's my conclusion is that they he's picking people that he thinks will pop like the big rating at like the keystone quarter hours love to have a state of goal of putting on a hot match first so i book qt marshall in my in my opening match i mean <laughs> i can't defame qt marshall's ability to have like you know good work rate matches like he holds his own in there um and i guess maybe you don't want him in the main event at all but i just you have to respect i you have to respect the titles more by putting in the main event i think you have to respect kenny omega more and adam page more it's not like you haven't had Dustin Rhodes in main events on Dynamite before. Um, hell, I don't know. Was the QT and Cody match on Dynamite? Was that a main event? No, that was like a 9 p.m. match maybe. Um, I just, you know, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy where by putting those guys in the first match on the show, you guarantee that they're not going to get to the level of importance that you want your tag team titles to have and you want your tag team champions to have. Yeah, I mean, unless, I mean, yes, Full stop. Unless you're going to have the best kinda, friends you win. Put, you, put the, you put the unless right there. Kind of made it seem like a comma. <laughs> I know. It didn't unless. sound like a new, a new sentence so much. Right. I just I wanted to make clear that I agree with you. <laughs> unless. And, and add in that. No. I, I take out the unless. Take out the unless. So, yes. New thought. New paragraph. <laughs> That's how I start most of my sentences. <laughs> new thought, colon. <laughs> have you ever... I'm assuming not, Nate, because it's 2020, but have you ever had to do um, dictation? Like speaking to someone and they type what I say? Yeah. No. I, I mean, I've I've taken emails before, um, but I don't do that really. <laughs> I don't when direct I, emails. When I was doing uh, my summer internship, like my, after my first year of law school, yeah, they were like, I worked at like this really small firm in the town where I'm, where I went to high school and the guy's like, yeah, we dictate everything. So you need to learn how to dictate memos, briefs, everything. So I would have to sit there and like, and it took me a billion times longer to try to like think it out. It was fucked up. Anyway, uh, new paragraph. That's what I would say if I were dictating (laughs) this thought is how dare you not ask me if I've not done any dictation. Well, I'm sorry, Mike. Have you done dictation? Well, of course not. No. What do you think I am? I, I did, Dumb did, question. Why yeah, you... <laughs> yeah, well, why would you ask me that? I just wanted to be included. God damn it. <sighs> <sighs> Look, if Best Friends won the title, you've put them over Chris Jericho in a main event. That's all I was going to say. Okay. But yeah, I mean, I've I've complained from probably day one that they've handled Kenny Omega completely wrong in this promotion. He should be a big star. I don't think he is. Um, and, and this I think he kind of still is, but I think they're just they're working against themselves by not believing in that and banking on it. You know, there's little subtle things you tell the audience when you put them on in the first segment on the show every week. It's like that fucking WWE pay per view where they were. It was literally a pay per view, but they were running opposite. I don't know, like Major League Baseball World Series or something. So they put the world title match of John Cena and Brock Lesnar and a third person and the first match of the show. And it's just like, you're, you're, you're giving away the game here. Like you're just, you're being, you're saying the quiet part loud and being like, Oh yeah, no, the nothing matters at all. We're just trying to grab these eyeballs for the brief window we can. And then uh, go about your day. It's just, it, it, we have to push back against that. That's why the cruiserweights were so important to WCW because they could put on a really exciting match first off, but it didn't matter at all in the grand scheme of things. So they weren't giving away anything. Silver King still mattered. Silver King mattered. Look, I agree. I, you know, that's how I came to know about Jushin Liger and it changed my whole life. But it, it wasn't, 
you know, you didn't have to part. already have the audience buy in for those guys. They could earn right. the audience buy in and then you could do your little programs with Silver King and La Parka and shit. But yep. yeah, you, you know, you don't, you don't put, you know, Kevin Nash versus Goldberg on in the first match on your show. You just don't. You, that's the main event. And that's what you build toward through the rest of the show and, uh, you know, make people excited for it in that way. All right, Mike, what's your pick? Well, I do have a pick, but first I want you all to check our group DM. I'm dropping a really funny tweet from friend of the show, a uh, Cubs fan. There's a great photo that's going to be in this. And I want your impressions on Sammy Guevara's fit today. It's an insane fit. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 I'll make sure that this, this tweet goes out on the account, but the way to describe this. He's in the high spots warehouse with all the DVDs that I'm looking at. Yeah, he has a shirt on top of the hoodie. The shirt has paint splatter, says big thoughts. He has a backwards uh, uh, a backwards uh, fit hat with sunglasses on top of it. And then the most like hold jeans I've seen possible. I'm not going to make any more comments about the the Urban Outfitters wear by FDR anymore. Because this is just like, I'm old. And I'm like looking at this and I'm actually going like these damn kids when I saw this photo. I love that the hole is so high up on the pants. It is so high up. You, it's like past like the little pocket thing that you would see with people have cut I think, off. I think the pocket seems to be hanging over the progress bar of the video. <laughs> yes, <very> right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to conclude. Um, you know, I uh, are those his boxer briefs in the hole to the right there with the blue yes. as well. I mean, I think he, so. he looks like a superstar. Uh, the fact that we don't understand it, I think, is probably a testament. To yes. the fact that he's well dressed here, I think. Uh, sure, because of course we're old That's and he's true. young. Um, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's good. Yeah, I I just wanted to give you all a little bit of happiness of our tear something apart on the show, <laughs> and that is the fact that yet again we had multiple pull apart brawls for like really not a lot of reason, and it completely dilutes each other. I mean, we had after the uh, the the world tag team title match we had a pull apart brawl that the bucks and ftr and butcher and the blade got involved in that just was like oh so this is happening and it completely like muddled everything other than like how wild the butcher look last night like talking about fits the fit check the butcher looks like lyle from Akewood, like straight up like there was like an insane look there and then you had another like pull apart brawl after mjf and billy and it just was something that, like, then it turned into Wardlow versus Luchasaurus. It just was, like, very muddled that when you have all these things happen, and they've been doing more and more of these brawls, they lose their effect. And to, to a point where, like, I had to remember just now, oh, wait, Luchasaurus somehow was in this brawl with with Billy of the Gun Club and MJF with Wardlow, two people who were not in this match, and it's setting something up for next week. And I just, like, look at these things, and I'm like, okay, this is – you're re you hit gold early on with this, but you're relying on this too much. It's completely muddling just the overall impact of it. And I hated it. Totally agree. Complained about that last week. I do think for this exact reason, that is part of why the Britt Baker and big swole segment was so good just because they didn't show it to us, which is like a great storytelling device that we really don't get enough of in wrestling. She drove off with Britt Baker and then we just found her later in the dumpster already. That was fantastic. They carried the segment. We, you know, we get to fill in and imagine what happened in the interim. And of course, we get the, you know, fun little banter with Britt Baker lying in the dumpster. Uh, but that's a great way to advance the feud without doing, oh, they throw a bunch of punches at each other and push each other around and, you know, uh, brawl the way to the back or whatever. Would love more of that. This plays into to my delete. I think it's my turn, right? Yep. Um, I, I mean, this is... Uh... This also plays into my delete from last week, the MJF Billy match, which is fine as like a thing. That's fine. You know, you can't expect it to be very good. It just, it is what it is. And it serves a real purpose that makes sense. You know, so I understand that, but I just have a real problem with there being no consequences for cheating. I have a real problem with this. He can win by hitting him with the diamond ring. <laughs> And he won't suffer any consequences for that. You can just, why doesn't everybody cheat in every match? Well, I mean, best friends won by cheating. Because Orange Cassidy grabbed uh, Sammy Guevara's leg and that distracted him enough so that the he, that uh, Trent was able to hit the crunchy. I kind of think you're, what, at least 15 years into your wrestling fandom? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, like, 
Well, I took a big break in the middle. I mean, I started right. watching wrestling at about five. Okay. But I took about 10 years off. So I'm yeah. about, t- yeah, 20 years into watching wrestling. Okay. I think the toothpaste is out of the tube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can, okay. I think that's kind of, I think that's honestly just kind of what it comes down to. Like, you're not wrong at all. Like, especially when it wants to be rankings matter, wins and losses matter. You know, the context of the match and quality wins matter. Like, if that stuff is all supposed to factor into where things go, then you shouldn't just <laughs> have the results of matches hinge on whether the referee saw something or not. Like, that's a little silly. But I kind of just think there's no way around it unless you're going to close yourself off to a million storytelling opportunities. I just think there's other ways to do it. Like, I think you can still have heels who cheat. I just think there has to be some sort of consequence to it in some way without it just letting you climb up the ladder, uh, you know, with, with impunity. I think it, it, cause it makes the refs look dumb. It makes the baby faces look weak. I just, I don't like anything about it. I really don't. It, and it's something that it's so like makes a match. Like I still believe the only DQ that's happened in a match was, Pack and won the falls in that two out of three out of that Iron Man match against uh, Kenny Omega, right? And they've had very little, exactly. like, they've had very little uh, count outs, but it's still one of those things that if your referees looked on it, it does, it kind of kills the idea of, oh, well, this DQ mattered because it was like the first fall lost by disqualification so far when you're like, but a lot of people get away with stuff. And it's one of those things that at least like, with Japan, it's something that the idea is, hey, if it happens outside the ring, you're outside the ring. That's your own damn fault. Whereas, yeah, absolutely. I, whereas I, it's, it's not cut and dry with like yeah. AEW. And I see where your point is with this. Yeah, I accept that about New Japan. I don't really have a problem with it. But they also don't really have people like pull out a ring from their trunks and hit somebody and then they win. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> but I can't say you're right. Yeah, I mean, that would be bad for your brand i think <laughs> it's like i don't know you know yano does like low blow people and then roll them up and shit and you kind of don't want to take that away from yano because it just gives you another storytelling thing you know it lets you give yano a meaningful win without taking it hurting somebody else and honestly i i like seeing cheating i because there was that period and might still be the case in the wwe where it's like oh heels literally cannot cheat we're just, you know, we're not doing cheating now. And so, like, when somebody cheats and it leads to the victory, I'm like, great. That's what a heel should do. That's what a heel's done in American wrestling for 100 years. That's great. It's kind of kind of where I fall on it. I don't mind. But for- it, it, it is one of the inherent tensions of pro wrestling. Yeah. I don't mind for heels to cheat. I just think it should never inure to their, to their ultimate benefit. Hey, maybe that's maybe they can use that and just say, "Hey, this is why MJF hasn't gotten his title shot yet, even though he's got all these wins." I would fucking love that. That'd be, I would that'd be a nice little fix. I do. Yeah. It does seem like they're leaning heavily on, or leaning more on the idea, and being more explicit and just saying Tony Khan makes the matches, which I think is an improvement. Yes, because now we don't have this stupid shit where it's like Cody and Kenny are admitting to being vice presidents and having the power to do all this stuff and just like not exploiting it or doing it in any sort of logical way. Like if they just take that away and just Tony Khan makes the matches that cleans it all up and simplifies everything. It does. And they can do something as simple that would work for me as to say, okay, MJF, you, or you could do it with Penelope Ford too. Okay. Penelope, you won this match. Now the ref didn't see it. You got away with it. Uh, if you do it in this match, you know, you get the title shot. Fine. If you do it in this match, there's going to be these consequences or whatever, just to, Make it seem like, I mean, we all saw it happen. Tony Khan was presumably watching the the video feed and also saw it happen. You know, like that's why it just irritates me because it makes, it makes me think, it makes me look dumb for continuing to watch this shit and knowing that people are just cheating. There is a reason that pro wrestling is not highly thought of in this country (laughs) and that it is largely watched by a lot of dumb people. You know, you can't yeah. throw that at the feet of AEW because there's been a, no. a different com- company monopolizing it for the better part of our lifetimes. But I, I guess that's it that's is kind really... of dumb. <laughs> yeah, but I guess as a form of entertainment. Well, I mean, it's as dumb as anything else. But I guess that's like my real complaint about it is that is a 
primarily a WWE thing. That is not when you have Yano. No, no, it's the, the loaded, firmly in the, the, the mid card, loaded boots, and yes, but there were consequences and... for those things. Yeah, they they never pretend. I mean, I'm sure it's happened at time, but generally, you would have consequences for doing those kinds of things, or at least it would backfire on you in some way, right? In the future, so that that's fine too. But I think, yeah, I, you know, I, I think he gets his come up into eventually. Maybe it looks like it's going to be. Ward Lowe turning on him sooner rather than later, which is not yeah. the weapons we want. But, yeah. you know, I, I, I do think they understand the story structure well enough that it's not going to be, yeah, uh, you know, never paid off. No, I, ju- I just think WWE has for years had an overabundance of heels winning matches like this before, I guess, they decided uh, not to do cheating. And in a way that that nobody ever, you know, in that company – people never get consequences. You know, there's really never come up for things. So I just fear that sometimes that's been normalized for other people. And, uh, you know, Tony Khan may not even think about it. He might just think, oh yeah, this is like a normal way to book a pro wrestling match because I've seen it a billion times, but uh, it sucks in a lot of ways. So anyway, that went longer than I intended it to go, but... Mostly because I just kept challenging you on everything you said. That's okay. I don't, I mean... I mean, I I did challenge things too. it's, it's It's not okay. So, and Mike, you didn't challenge him at all. So, you're both wrong. I challenged him about not wait, 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 wait. dictation. Now you're saying I'm wrong for saying it was okay. So, you're. Yeah, I was doing a bit. Calling me out for challenging. I mean, this is fucked up. Um, I just, I guess I am like a crotchety old man in some ways about my, my pro wrestling, what I like in pro wrestling. So, I try to fight against that, but some old things are actually good. And you have to just acknowledge that. Maybe. <laughs> I do distinctly remember. <laughs> you ever have just one of your friends just like say something insightful about your personality that you didn't really realize? And then you're like, oh, yeah, that's that's correct about myself. I could. Yeah, I just remember one of my friends in college who, uh, you know, I, I was burying something he liked or whatever. And he's like, yeah, because, you know, all things are necessarily stupid just because they've been done for a long time or whatever. Like every tradition is stupid just because it's a tradition. I was like, yeah, no, I, I do kind of think that way. And <laughs> I guess there's a possibility I could be wrong. Although I, I now I'm coming back to the idea that, no, I, that's right. Everything that's old is actually bad for being a tradition. Because, you know, look at the society it's gotten us. Um, that's true. Oh, yeah, that's that stands out in my mind. I kind of think we should start from the baseline that it's bad if it's hung around for a long time. Yeah. And you have to kind of prove the theory wrong you have to affirmatively prove that no it's actually good and it works yes all this way yeah yeah i agree i had a similar thing i have a friend who's like a real astrology person which is which is whatever but she sent me this thing one time i'm a gemini in case anyone's wondering my birthday is tomorrow by the way if anybody wants to wish me happy birthday tomorrow he will be updating his spreadsheet (laughs) <laughs> yes, of the people who were nice to me and the people who were not nice to me on my I birthday. Just, I got mine out of the way, so don't forget tomorrow. No, it only, it only counts on my birthday, actually. So, um, schedule tweets now. <laughs> uh, but anyway, one of these like Gemini things was that uh, they like to talk about themselves. And I, got, I think it was thinking about the conversation she and I were having at that moment. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've just been like talking about my own shit and not asking you about your shit for like an hour. So, yeah, it was a real moment for me. So, yes, I get what you're saying. I haven't changed, but I've thought about it more. (laughs) It's just you you internalize it and then you feel guilty about it. Yes. uh, And then you just become less happy overall. It's like sometimes you're like, wait, it's hard to change something I've been doing for like 30 years or whatever. Maybe not 30 years, probably at four. I wasn't doing this, but anyway, change is hard. We also did the, uh, in high school, we used to have Festivus parties, or one guy in particular would have Festivus parties. It was like a big party. Um, and, you know, all would get pretty crowded. Uh, and, you know, of course, they have the airing of grievances. Sure. And I uh, remember one of my best friends was like, I just want to air my grievance with Nate. It's <laughs> like, uh, you know, Nate, Nate has to be right and has to be correct so much. That sometimes I just wish you wouldn't talk. Wow. <laughs> this, this Whoa. But it was like, I laughed. I like <laughs> one of the hardest I've ever laughed in my life. Just Cause it's like, Oh yeah, no, that's, you got me. That's accurate. I mean, I would never it's say that. that it's somebody, it's somebody you love, you know? 
Sure. I would never say I wish you wouldn't talk, but I mean, you haven't changed much since high school, it sounds like, Nate. Right. Well, see, again, my thing <laughs> is, as with the, you know, not respecting traditions thing, I think I'm just right. I think that's, mm. so what, you know, what, what can you do? Right. I, I mean, I totally get that. I like talking about astrology. I mean, I am a cancer. Like my birthday is coming up too. I don't keep a spreadsheet. Well, I'll count that for you because I don't need I to do. keep a spreadsheet to know who people truly love me. But, I do. I do. <laughs> but like the idea of like you are who you are and it's so like ingrained with you that you can change little things. But there's a lot of things that are like corely set when you're very young. I've had like friends like pull me aside and be like, Mike, you know, like when you don't want to deal with people, you really make it known that you don't want to deal with people and that you'd rather be at home reading a book or doing literally anything else than talking to people. It's like, you're, like, you're kind of thorny. And I'm like, okay. And then like, it took me like a little bit later. I was like, maybe I need to be more of a pleasant person. Tonight. So like, I understand like the wanting to be right, like being like outwardly social. Like I do understand that. I would never describe you as thorny, Mike. I wouldn't either. I wouldn't either. I think you're a very sweet boy. Well, it's because we, we, have, we have scheduled times. Yeah, <laughs> right. that's true. I, right. I, I, I block my social good. energy for the week knowing that we will be talking for here to here. That's fair. I that. Okay. I, um, what was it? Uh, hmm. I thought I was I had something profound to say, I think, there. But I seem to have lost it. Oh, I've, I've tried to develop more chill. Mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been called zero chill AB in the I, past. We've seen that develop on this very show. I, I've tried to develop more chill and not uh, get so mad about things and, and uh, tell people to go to hell so much. So you, you, you see, I, I, I like this, the zero chill part because I'm someone that I've been, I have a proclivity to some, some, just tell someone to fuck off. Like, I understand that. Yeah. But sometimes I think I let myself get pissed off about things that, that just don't matter that much or... That's fair. Yeah. Or kind of like what we've said about AEW. It's like, I get mad about some things that I just have to accept as part of life. Yeah. There is a point at which anger might be beneficial. There's a point at which it's no longer beneficial. And yeah. just self-harming like, um, yourself. Yeah. There's, there's sometimes yeah. there's, uh, in the context of my job, sometimes people will be like, hey, should I worry about this? And like my honest answer is, there's no benefit to you worrying about it because you can't <laughs> impact it one way or the other. So the answer is no, you shouldn't worry about it, but that's not really what you're asking me. Is <laughs> Right. I just, I generally get very perturbed at people who are rude in public, like people who, you know, I got into it with this guy once at a bar in Nashville because his drunk ass wife spilled her bill, beer all over my cell phone. This is a, uh, I've, I think I've lived this story with you as far yeah. as people spilling drinks. And I'm like, Okay, but this is like, she's stumbling. Or I'm like, take this woman home. You know, like, she does not need to be in public anymore. So I was mad. And and then afterwards, I said to Sarah, like, you know, maybe I just have to accept that if I'm going to go in public, people are going to be rude and there's just not much I can do about it. Yeah. It's, it's hard to come to peace with all of humanity. It really is. <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm just so aggrieved by existence, you yeah. know? Well, I didn't ask for it. What the fuck? Exactly. I'm not even having a good time. <laughs> I wasn't even supposed to be here this lifetime. <laughs> that's right. Oh, God. Well, that's enough existential musings for one episode. For one segment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ratings. Let's talk about those. There's nothing existential about keeping up with how many people watch a television show every week. Yeah, so, this is pretty finite stuff. Yeah, AEW, a big bump in... Total viewers from 677 to 772, up to eighth in the demo with a 0.28. Pretty basically a rebound to form for them. AEW, I'm sorry, NXT also got a smaller bump up to 746 and a 0.20 in the demo, which was good for 25th overall. Yeah. So this is NXT's, like, y'all know my feelings about the uh, overall viewership numbers. But this is their best one they've had since the middle of February. So, but they, the interesting thing is they've been gaining viewers and it's almost been like a balancing effect because pretty much since 2020 happened, AEW has won by like an average of 0.11 in the demo share. So, like they're rebounding, but the thing is that, and, and they are a little bit tighter than they've been in past weeks, but they still pretty much have stayed 
virtually like the same distance behind a AEW, at least in the demo. Uh, this is just was like a night where it was, this is like a summer night. And the only things that are above AEW that were non news were property brothers and that dang challenge. So there's really nothing on. I, I do have a couple of weird demo things. Uh, AEW had the same females 12 to 34 as an afternoon premiership game, Premier League game. So like Premier League is back in in the United Kingdom right now. So like the, that's where that kind of works out there. And the, I have a list of shows because this was something that I thought was pretty remarkable. The uh, people who are 18 to 34 is to like a 0.08 for NXT. I have a long list of peop- of shows that have worse numbers on it in that demo and basically all of them are new shows especially new shows on msnbc and on fox news a show called counting cars which i never heard of and a repeat of the real housewives of beverly hills so weird demo corner i was thinking about making a counting cars counting crows joke and i just i think that's bad i think that's bad that would have been a bad joke of the week for me yeah i mean there's only like two or three good counting crows jokes you can make and all of them have been kind of done to death because there's not very many good counting crows jokes so good choice I'm big i'm a big counting crows fan you would be would i yeah why listen to the crowning crows when you can listen to third eye blind uh well third eye blind is not as good as counting crows False. I, have, I have to say uh counting crows are, are good i saw them uh live a few years i've seen third eye blind a bunch of times i've got a well, my friend nathan is obsessed with Third Eye Blind, and we've seen them live a lot. I've only seen Counting Crows once. I would not recommend Obsession on either, but... Um, I I would recommend Obsession with any musical artist that you are fond of. I mean, mm. nobody would take it seriously from me if I said, if I opposed Obsession with a, with a band. I guess. I mean, they wouldn't. I mean, you, you guys look at my room every week. Okay, dynamite this week. We're finally <laughs> going to talk about that show. It, it was just the way that you said you look into my room every week that I just. Oh well, my I think I've talked about this. The office that I sure. record from is Has decorated a giant Byleth wall scroll on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and is otherwise decorated with <laughs> uh, prints from almost all of the Jason Isbell shows I've been to. It, it, I, oh, I have I a I have a spreadsheet that counts the shows <laughs> I've been to and which shows I have posters from. Okay, so that I can find the other ones that I don't have. So what's so what's your what's your uh, ratio at? Like, what's your percentage of prints? Oh, I've got almost all of them. So why do you need a spreadsheet to determine? You can have like a list of these are the shows okay. I've not had it. Yeah, if you're gonna have a spreadsheet, I'd like to get some exact well, percentages. Yeah, I did. I didn't have as many as I do now when I started keeping the spreadsheet. It was a way okay. for me to figure out which ones okay. I didn't have. Okay. Mm-hmm. So now That's there fair. are some shows it appears there was not a print for. How can you even know those shows existed? I don't know. Maybe you never even went. <laughs> it's it's possible. Terrifying possible. Do you ever? I mean, I think about false memories a lot. <laughs> oh yeah, oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like memory imprinting and false memory scan printed. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Especially when I like unearth a new memory that I haven't. You know, yeah. sometimes you just have a new memory unlock and then, uh, you know, just you learn too much about false memories or whatever. And then it's like, oh, no, I can't trust myself at all. Who knows if that really happened? <laughs> all right. So the show started <laughs> <laughs> with Kenny Omega and Hangman Page defeating the natural nightmares. Page pinned QT after the last call. I guess we talked about this, but it was a good match. Honestly, I liked it a lot. Fun opener. Yeah, you know, again, the the work of these is always good. This, the uh, the philosophy of them is what I take issue with. Yeah, yeah, like this hit all the notes you would hope that this match would hit. You had like your big alley moment. You had QT doing his crazy, uh, just moves that he should not be doing with his body type, and it's just you know, it's just like the things that we presented before about opening up with a title match when a contendership match is in the main event that you know. In a vacuum, this was this did exactly what it should do. But when you like you're piecing together the puzzle, when you're making the pizza, when you're making the sandwich or whatever that is AEW Dynamite, this feels like you're putting the meat on the outside. Mm. How's that for simile? It was good. I liked it. Well, there was a, there was a, a few of them. We got a we got a handful. 
It made sense <laughs> for the sandwich. Now for the pizza, I think you want. I think the meat goes on top, which is the outside, <laughs> right? And for a puzzle, there should be no meat involved whatsoever. <laughs> what? If, well, it could be meat as part of the picture that's in the puzzle. Even then, it's still in the it's in the body of the puzzle, so it'd be inside. I think. What about a stuffed crust pizza? Despicable. That's just cheese. That's despicable. cheese. Despicable. No, they put pepperoni in some of them. Oh, okay. Well, doubly despicable. No, no. I, I kind of like. Do, I, yeah, I like the stuffed crust as like a uh, just a real over the top obscene American sort of food thing. Yeah. Too much dairy. Yeah, it, I mean, I like certainly it. in my younger days, I liked it more. Isn't that fucked up? I've been doing so since quarantine. I've been doing these like workout, like cardio videos, uh, because I can't go to the gym. And about every second to third day, I've got like a pulled muscle somewhere. That yeah, can only be attributed to getting old. I think everything deteriorating forever. Yeah, that's cool. It's fun. Anna J had a video. <laughs> she said. So she thought it was a, that, you know, appearing on AW was going to be a good opportunity to showcase her talent. Then when she got signed, she knew she had to work 10 times harder. I like the the suggestion that she wasn't really working all that hard before she got signed. But now now she's going to turn it on, which, frankly, is relatable, except I don't turn it on at any point. Right. Now, well, you, you might have turned it on for the first couple months. Right. And then. Yeah, that's the story of like every job I've ever had where it's like. My last job, I hated it. And by the end of it, I was like, you know, it was miserable. And I'm like, all right, this new job is going to be different. I'm going to not procrastinate all day. I'm going to do my work. And I do that for like two weeks. And then it's just the same thing mm -hmm. again. Yeah, I think Anna J will do better than us, probably. <laughs> I think she's already done better than us. <laughs> <laughs> she says, now she knows she has to put on a show. That's why she calls herself the star of the show. And then we got... Abaddon defeating Anna J with what I've called a short spike Rana. Yeah, it's a baby Rana. Somebody did Candice used to do this spot a lot. I've definitely seen somebody used to do this spot regularly. Uh, she's done it. Giant Gargano used to have a baby Rana. Uh, it's probably where where they got it from. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I, I mean, I just put over this match and the booking of it, but I actually don't like to see this Abaddon gimmick on. AEW very often, it's just not my shit at all. You know, dark, spooky, zombie. Oh, I don't play uh, horror video games. This is way beyond like me. It's not, yeah, I've never, not just does at no point does that intersect with my interests. I, I hate being startled. Like, I have a guttural reaction to being startled. So I feel like Abaddon would be the character that would like do a jump scare. Like, yeah. I, I've played video games where like the second I get like startled, I throw the controller. It's not out of fear. It's more of me getting tricked. I get angry about getting tricked. That's all I got. Okay. Uh, the Dark Order came out after the match. They're all kind of standing there. Eva Luno walked over, handed a manila folder with the Dark Order logo on it to Colt Cabana. And 10 and 5 helped Anna J out of the ring and to the back. I love a, uh, a sinister folder. Big yeah. pop for me for a sinister manila folder. Yeah, it was good. I, I like, I mean, they went through with putting the logo on the folder, I think was the best part. Really tied the bit together. MJF defeated Billy Gunn. He hit him with the dynamite diamond ring after the match. And see, I, I agree with you, Mike, but I think it was organic enough at the start of this where it's like Jungle Boy was mad. Jungle Boy was, was cosplaying as Aaron and he was mad about MJF using the ring to win. And so he kind of gets into it organically with MJF and they have some history. So you could build back to that again. Uh, but yeah, I, I did. I was kind of tired of the big brawl, except for Marco on Wardlow's back. I mean, I'm happy that next week is going to be Wardlow day. Like I could take that from this, but when you have this and like a brawl, we really did not talk about much after the tag team match happening. And if we did have, it's all molded together in my brain right now. Like this is my point. Exactly. Like, Lay off the brawls, they're losing their effect. They're like mush in my head. But Marco jumping on his back ruled. Les Sex Gods were backstage with Alex Marvez. Jericho said, you want to know why Blood Orange was juiced? It's because every well, everyone loves him. He's so cool. But he had the audacity to interrupt the inner circle twice. Jericho said he knows that 
Orange wants to be a funny guy, but what happened to him last week, there ain't nothing funny about that. And this leads to a, a joke off between Sammy and Jericho. As Sammy says, they beat him to a pulp. Jericho says, we're going to do that to the best friends too, because we're not just best friends. We're brothers, blood brothers, and blood is thicker than water, or in this case, thicker than a Snickers. Orange juice. Orange juice. <laughs> Uh, Tony. No, no mention of Mike Tyson at this point. Now it's all focused on uh, Orange Cassidy for Fighter Fest. Well, some didn't somebody say that Jericho suggested somewhere that the Tyson thing is never getting followed up on. Uh, if somebody said that, I was not alerted. I think maybe in some interview he suggested that that's the end of the. Tyson I saw a headline thing. that was like Jericho wants the feud to go all the way to a match in an AEW ring. That was the last headline I saw. Hmm. Tony Schiavone was with Britt Baker. He announced that Penelope Ford is going to challenge Shikaru Shida at Fighter Fest for the women's title. Britt says, is this what you waddled down here to tell me? She's very mad. She says, because of how mad she is, Tony's lost an interview with the face of the women's division. The people at TNT are going to be pissed. And Britt Baker and Tony are on friendship timeout. Yells for Reba to get her out of here. But folks, it's not Reba. Big Swole is driving the vehicle. <laughs> Where to, Brittany? I'm glad that she was willing to like do that. <laughs> the camera, the shot here too. It's like very great work. Great work. We also had the uh, the uh, clothesline so that uh, Britt Baker could send notes to Tony all night long, which was great thing. They always made a big deal about this and. Yeah, Britt Baker is is quickly moving up like my personal list as like most charismatic and best on interviews just with stuff like this. There was a I think right after Britt like insulted him for the first time, Tony just does like a little a little look off to the side, which is it was just like a great comic beat. And like, you know, you don't think of like these guys like Tony or like Jim Ross as like performers, you know? But this was just like a, a great little performer moment that you get from like Somebody who understands they're putting on a performance and, you know, basically acting out there. I was like, oh, yeah, that's Tony Schiavone at his core is like acting. True. I, I was watching Starcade 83 the other night and it's wild sure. to think as, as one does. And it's wild to think that Tony has literally been doing this longer than I've been alive. I mean, there he, he is has, backstage. He's pretty good, I guess. He's still. Oh, yeah. That's well, a, you, you missed him with, he's got the big mustache uh, at Starcade mm, 83. I did miss him with that. <laughs> miss me with that mustache. <laughs> All right. Speaking of mustaches, actually, I think Arn shaved, hasn't he? Can't remember now. Cody's out with Arn Anderson. It's time for the open challenge. Cody says after getting beaten down by Hager last week, he found himself without Dustin, Kenny, the Bucks, Hangman. He says, am I even in the elite? Is the Nightmare family even a family? And I didn't actually see it, but I believe Rawl suggested that he made the Four Horsemen sign again during this part of the segment. Nate didn't see it. Oh, I don't watch the show. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you just just here for takes. I just <laughs> yeah. react. You just react to the discourse. Oh, the vlogs, yeah. And <laughs> vlogs. <laughs> I mean, do do we? I mean, this is building toward a Cody heel turn, right? Uh, maybe. I don't know. It, it, it's one of those things that without having him out in front of the crowd, you can't really tell. Like, Because, I mean, it, it could be like one of those things that he's going to turn on people, but the crowd's not going to perceive him as a heel, you know? Just because yeah. like, like that. Like, it's difficult to tell. And he's always kind of a dick anyway. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think I mentioned when he did that Tom Brady promo, it's like, yeah, you know, might be getting there as far as getting to a heel turn. And Four Horsemen would make sense as a heel unit and we pitched you know cody as the flair ftr as the tag team and we were trying to come up with a young young gun to put in that fourth spot and elevate with a four horseman unit uh obviously alan angels was my pick but he joined the dark order instead so maybe that fourth guy is ricky starks hmm that's interesting and the ftr thing would give him a, you know a natural feud with the bucks so that would be good i don't know i to me, that would be fun because I think we've kind of – I'm alone – or not alone on this, but, I mean, your majority of your AEW 
crowd still loves Cody at the same level and is going right. to love him probably as long as he wants to do this act. But I think it would be fun to watch him try to do something completely different. And like, that's a way you could backdoor your way into him rationalizing himself ever for the world title. That's true. So I'm like, there's a lot of variability there and it, it's interesting. And I don't know if it's one of those things that maybe y'all are playing enough seeds in my head that maybe I'm going to believe that this could be a, a heel turn, especially the Tom Brady thing. I mean, that's one of the most healest things you can do is talk about Tom Brady in a positive light, but I don't know. It's interesting because it does seem like more and more they've made more hints about like a Forrestman thing. I mean, you had the whole thing of Tully Blanchard giving Sean Spears the glove and talking about the people who had the glove. Like it does feel like something's happening. I just can't connect the dots. I don't have my, I, I don't have my Britt Baker conspiracy theory map where I have my, my red string out yet. But maybe they're just fucking with us. I think that's also. They could be. They entirely could be. So Arn gets the mic. He says, you have to listen sometimes to the voice of reason. I know you believe you can beat Hager. I know you can beat Hager. But in this business, timing is everything. And the timing is just not right. Let's move past it. What does this mean? He's having the match with Hager. (laughs) What was Um, the point of this promo? I don't know. I don't either. But anyway, mm-hmm. he says, tonight you have a qualified opponent who's very talented, but he's a guy you can take it to and hone your skills. Really great way to put over this guy before he comes out to make his debut. So, yeah. yeah. There's a video. It's Ricky Starks. He plugs himself as a former NWA television champion and the hottest free agent. He says when he had nothing else, he had work ethic and grit, the same as Cody. Cody says he can go on the track with anyone. Guess what, baby boy? I got my shoes tied tight. Good little video and promo here from Ricky Starks. Yeah, so my my elite pick was almost, you know, until ba- basically later that evening. Uh, just the way that this promotion kind of respects stuff that comes from other companies, like they integrate, you know, whatever, maybe Cody or Matt Hardy's history in WWE into their characters. Or, you know, Ricky Starks come here and is like, hey, I was an NWA television title holder. Uh, and that is meaningful. And they don't just like acknowledge stuff, but like they make it seem like not only that there's wrestling outside of AEW or wrestling outside of AEW and WWE, but the other wrestling actually has like value and is meaningful and like isn't just people dicking around in a bingo hall, but it like has some value to it. Or like, uh, you know, Joey going off the roof with Zandig, like that is like a meaningful thing and there's like value to that GCW crazy bump. Um, and I thought that was all great, uh, but they kind of subverted it and they kind of subverted uh, what they meant to do here with Cody saying, hey, this is a good warm up match for you because then they just signed Ricky Starks, <laughs> which is like the right decision. <laughs> but it also kind of it's like, OK, you know, it's all fun and good to have a fun thing where we have people come from the outside and wrestle for this title. Uh, but if you sign all of them, <laughs> it kind of takes away the magic. Uh, yeah, by the way, Cody won the match for the TNT Championship. Uh, defeating Ricky Starks with the crossroads. Yeah, this match rolled. Uh, the, like, Ricky is someone that I was calling, like, before Double or Nothing, I thought it was going to be Ricky Starks as the mystery person and the the, uh, the ladder match to decide the next world title challenger. And I felt like that he was exactly, like, this was, like, a great TV title match. And I, like, and in, like, that context, I think that Ricky Starks is one of the more talented people who does do self-produced content i i mean he did like the whole him and sammy guevara versus a broom and fire thing where he, like he lit himself on fire for something which is wild so yeah this was just like a great time and i did see something that apparently he's going to be going as absolute and not stroke daddy because apparently tnt does not like stroke daddy so he's absolute ricky starks which is shame because he had like that really great promo that that great tagline he has about him so i guess that's not going to happen here yeah, um, you know, makes total sense for this promotion. A guy who was just like, I'm going to get myself over now. And, you know, had all these great looking videos made to establish his character and make himself like a, 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 a commodity on the indies and, you know, you know, can deliver in the ring and all those things. So great signing. Um, they also put over Excalibur's like, hey, our great friends in DDT, Ricky Starks, you know, how to run with DDT as well. So, you know, increases those sort of connections. Um yeah, you know, that uh, that Arn line now does kind of, it would be sort of appropriate if Cody was like, hey, you know, I think you've got it. You know, you're not at my level just yet, but, you know, come under my wing, come under Arn's wing. 
Uh, and I think Ricky Starks act very relatable video or very uh, endearing video here for his little introductory promo. But I think he's a lot better as a heel. So I think in a heel four horsemen that would let him play to his strengths. Also, he can't be stroke daddy because I'm still holding out hope that the dirty daddy is going to come into this promotion one day. And uh, you can't have two daddies. Also, you also you already have daddy eats first. You're going to say that during Pride Month, Aaron? <laughs> You're right. Everybody, you have as many daddies as you like. That's a joke about literal fathers, not anything else, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the Young Bucks defeated the British Basement Boys. The Bucks won with a Kamigoye. Yeah. yeah. Go to a Bushy <laughs> yeah. finisher. Yeah, weird. During the match. Well, they've been, they have picked it up and started using it since that uh, match with Hangman and, and Kenny. I mean, this might have been their first straight ahead, straightforward tag match since that match, right? I think it was uh, the first normal match they worked in like four months. That sounds right. It's been a while. I, I did like this match started and I was like, man, it's like refreshing to see the Young Bucks in like a tag match with rules. Like, what yeah. a novelty. Yeah, because I was thinking about, you know, our, our big take back then was, wow, these guys are really good at TV wrestling. And I was like, oh, yeah. These guys are really good at TV wrestling. I didn't get to see it for a while. I, I didn't realize that the brawl happened after this match. I thought it was after the opening match. I apologize. That's okay. During the match, the Butcher and the Blade were were menacing. So FTR came out to kind of even the, the sides. Uh, after the match, yeah, Butcher and Blade and FTR uh, came in the ring fighting each other. And then we saw the Bucks and FTR split up Butcher and Blade. One did the Indie Taker. One did the mind breaker, and that was it. Nate, I do you want to do your your tweet? Do you want to do it live on the air? Well, do I, ooh, I can do my tweet live on the air. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I just think it's neat when you have little storytelling devices like this. Just that these teams are foils of each other. One represents one theory of tag team wrestling, and one school, and one uh, audience. And the other one represents the polar opposite of that. Uh, but they are alike more than they are different. And we kind of see that because they both have these spike pile driver finishers now. So just a you know fun little thing. And when you're in a wrestling match, you can reverse one spike pile driver into the other team's spike pile driver. And it's just a good little way to do a you know battle of wrestling philosophies as a kinetic combat story. Nate, your your tweet was much more concise. Yeah, no, this is why you uh, download the podcast is so I can uh, elongate it by 40 to 60 seconds each. <laughs> we see a video of Taz. He's with Brian Cage. Taz talks about hearing John Moxley last week saying he was going to beat up Cage and shut Taz up for good. He says, you want to call yourself miserable? I took that gimmick years ago. He's very concerned about gimmick infringement, Taz. Uh, Cage says, basically, you're disrespecting us. You're bringing what's going to happen to you on yourself. And he wishes Fighter Fest was right now. He says, who better? Who better? Took from Canyon, of course, who is his mentor. And hey, pile him on. Like I said, he's going to be the man of a thousand nicknames and catchphrases. And I'm all for it. <laughs> I The reason I didn't do that part, Nate, was I missed uh, part of the line. Not the who better part, but right before that or right after it. I couldn't hear what he said, so I just left it out. It's okay. That's just what I, I got. It. I pick up the slack. No worries. Thanks, Glad. I appreciate it. I, I just like Taz saying we were in our trailer doing body guy stuff. Oh, fuck. I forgot to say. I actually did write that down. I forgot. To say. <laughs> it, it was great because Taz had a shirt that I thought looked like a uh, mock turtleneck. And you know how I feel about people wearing mock turtlenecks on AEW. But no, it was this like, shirt that was incredibly tight across his neck, which made it, it an incredibly great line. The fact that he said body guy stuff. I may have forgotten how Mike feels about people wearing mock turtlenecks on <laughs> AEW. I, I, I'm i amused by people who wear mock turtlenecks. You're I think. amused by them. Okay. Yeah. Just general, general amusement. I'm not just Was there amused. somebody else that, that notably wore a mock turtleneck? Mock turtleneck for the Dark Order. Oh, turtleneck guy. Yeah. Right right there in the name. Okay. Right. My, my mother once said to me, do you know why they call it a mock turtleneck? And I said, why, mother? And she said, because people mock you when you wear it. Got Hell him. yeah. <laughs> Got him. Crack it. John Moxley 
Was up next? That's my joke of the week, folks. Hey, this is better than the Cannon Crows one. <laughs> I didn't even do the joke, Nate. Yeah, we cut that off the past because no. we knew that this would be bad. That's right. Which it was. It was. So Moxley says, "What? You climbed the ladder and pulled down some gimmick. Now you think you can step in the ring with the AEW World Champ, the Judge, the Jury, and Executioner, the guy who makes heads roll." Sorry, I got a little hyped up about this promo. It was good. He said, I have demons, bad ones, and the only thing that helps is hurting people in the ring. And now your path has crossed my path. So beat me if you can. Survive if you're the kind of miserable son of a bitch who can survive what I'm going to do to you. I think this was better than any of Mox's like live promos of late. His pre-tapes are reliably better than the live stuff he does. Yeah. I don't know what to say about that, but it's, Me it's neither. noteworthy. <laughs> Especially on these, the, all these, these shows are pre-taped in their entirety. So I <laughs> right. wonder what the difference is exactly, but there seems to be some difference. Yeah. Uh, another video. It's Rebel. She's trying to find Brit. That Brit's in the trash can, folks. She says, where have you been? I've been here for five hours. Rebel suggests it's only been one hour. And so Brit fires her for disagreeing with her, but then rehires her because she still needs help getting out of the trash can. She's mad that Tony isn't there and Rebel has to remind her that they're in friend timeout. And Britt says, Big Swole, you will pay for this. Just tremendous. I I yeah. mean, I mean, Rebel is the, the person that when she first appeared on screen, like doing the role model stuff, I was like, oh no, she's pretty funny at this. But like her being like, the, the person that's like, no, it's been one. And how great she is at playing like the put upon assistant really is the glue that ties it together. And then I saw that Tony Khan made a tweet that there was a, re that there was a Reba cam and that's why they had the camera and the lights there because they were trying to get like this, but then there was no of that. I thought that this was all great. And you know, Britt Baker is owning her right now. Last was the main event. The best friends defeated lay sex gods to, to um, hmm, retain their number one contendership. Sure. I'm going to go with that. Uh, Trent pinned, Sammy with the strong zero, I thought, but Mike said earlier that it was something else, I think, but I think it was the strong zero. No, it was the crunchy because he the strong zero involves the double stomp. Chuck did not double no, stomp. I don't think Sammy. so. That's no, false. I, I, That's think false. Mike, I think Mike's right as far as the definition of the strong zero. Yeah, no. I'm, I don't think so. Look it up. I'm disagreeing on this. I mean, I have factual evidence to back up that the crunchy slash dude buster is a different move than the strong zero. Chuck did not deliver the double stomp. This was not a strong zero. Mm, call him bullshit on this. Matt Hardy there, was on kind of rationale for this or from me. Yeah. No, I don't rationalize things. Okay. <laughs> I just say whatever I think. Playing it by, by pure emotional, yeah. whatever guile. Yeah. I mean, I know facts don't normally care about your feelings, but in this specific instance. Aaron's, Aaron's feelings do not care about the facts. <laughs> right. I mean, everybody knows. It's like part of my thing that I don't know what moves are called. But I, mean, I do. I know. That's why this is funny, <laughs> Mike. That's why it's funny that I'm disagreeing I, I, with you. Are you trying to get me hot? Is that, is that like the, the thing here? It's trying to rile me up. Yeah, I want to see you get thorny. No, I'm good, man. I'm tired. No. Yeah. Damn. Uh, does anybody have anything to say about this match? Before I oh, talk good. About it was fun. It was fun. Seeing Chuck Taylor and Chris Jericho face off one on one is a real just this is 2020 moment. That see, there was a lot of talk about that, and it really hurt my feelings because I guess I have just um internalized this promotion so much that it just seemed normal to me, and I felt really bad that everybody else could enjoy this moment that I couldn't enjoy. I mean, I did I pushed back because I was like that is weird that Chris Jericho and Chuck Taylor, you know, had a go. But Chris Jericho has been teaming with Sammy Guevara as a lay sex gods for a number of months. <laughs> and, they, no, that, and, they did, and they did in this match uh, reprise their signature tag team pose <laughs> where Chris Jericho poses on top of Sammy Guevara. And these are just things, you know, that you tell us this a year ago or 18 months ago. Uh, and they're just they're fully insane, like yeah. in another universe. But we're Which in another weirder, universe though? in a lot of ways. Which one's weirder, though? It, Chuck versus Chris Jericho I think, or I think, Less Sex Gods? I think Less Sex Gods is weirder. Okay. Um, I 
you know, there's a not too distant universe where Chuck Taylor is just like an NXT guy, right? Like they signed Sam Shaw and made him hugely <laughs> pushed. Dexter like, Loomis. Yeah, there's a universe where like Chuck Taylor is in the class with like um I don't know, Rich Swan and, and those guys, right? And yeah. then maybe he just crosses path with Jericho and it's not super insane. Right. I guess. That's not the universe we live in. Oh, I think this one's better, at least in that aspect. I was gonna I was gonna push <laughs> back on that one. In that aspect. <laughs> Point of clarification. I was saying last night on the on the Discord live chat that I'm just so happy that Jericho came to AW and New Japan to do this stuff because it really changes like in 20 years looking back on his career, it like changes everything about oh. what he looks like as a as a wrestler over his career. So it's just it's it rules. I'm glad. Absolutely. You know, there's every other guy in the business is like, no, I just it's, I wrestled for WWE and that's it. It's the end all be all. Uh, and he's like, no, I'm going to like learn and see what else is out there. And what else is happening? Speaking of the discord live chat, was there uh, any verdict on Mike's mouth sound songs discussed? Well, the, the segment was universally loved. I just want to okay. say everybody enjoyed it. Uh, I didn't wait. Somebody said that there was at least one song that they immediately recognized. Right, Mike? Do you recall that? I I, I think the discourse throughout the world has been that this was a incredibly lauded segment that I'm yeah. a mouth sound virtuoso that myself and for and fellow podcaster Spencer Hall should be doing a duet series where he does songs like Casio Dog. Like, like you know how Casio sounds like, but doing it as a dog barking where we do duets to her. Yeah. It, it it might be like the most lauded podcast of all time. But was there any uh, verdict as far as whether anybody could identify the songs other than that, maybe that one person, which you weren't sure about? I, I think that people got it. I think that sometimes, okay. you know, I think you either get my songs or you think I'm terrible at them. I, I don't think there's people that are like 50, 50. I think it's, mm. there's no dichot. I think there's a real dichotomy. It's either. Two best no. people in the world. Yeah. You either get my songs and you think that I, committed some of the most like important podcasting since i don't know when or you think that i cereal that, well like if that's cereal then like is cereal really that important in, like all things yeah like this um, I mean, the, honestly, the, the guy, first thing i thought of was that this american life episode with the guy who made up all the stuff about the apple factories right yeah like the mike daisy was, daisy was, uh, yeah same guy who made up the Kawhi leonard story i think about apples Hey, um, oh, and I thought about that today, and that made me so happy until someone told me it was fake. I did not know that Kawhi Leonard did not go Apple Time, Apple Time. I, I'll tell you what uh, an important podcast was, was the um, – well, I don't remember the name of it. But... Okay, I'm get, no, hold on. Okay. Do you think there's any correlation between understanding Mike's Mouth Sound songs and enjoying the taste of cilantro? This is I, interesting. I don't understand this. It, it just, it, I mean, we don't, we don't know, know why – there's that divide. It's some sort of uh, genetic delineation, but there appears to be two types of people in the world. And I'm wondering if those groups line up with each other. Yeah. We're going to see if like, is it yes, cilantro? Yes, my sounds. Or is it no songs? Yes, cilantro. Right. We're gonna I think yeah, do, a, do a poll on the Patreon. Find out the people who can adjudicate Mike's songs if they also happen to like cilantro. In the Dark was the podcast I was thinking of. And they literally, like, I'm pretty tired of the let's go look at an old case and, and see see what happens podcast. I'm glad people are doing that work. I just like am kind of bored of listening to it because basically everyone who's been wrongly convicted was wrongly convicted in exactly the same way or in the same ways. And, but in this case, they destroyed the prosecution's case, got all the witnesses to go back on their stories. And now the guy is, is free. He was on death row and is now not on death row. So mm. that was a pretty important podcast. And that oh, yeah. I would, Mike, Mike yours is the best since that, since that. Right. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, that's saying that's saving someone's life. This that's right. The, 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 well, the, yeah. This is only improving many people's lives. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I and mean, I want to be honest, that in the dark only improved one person's life. Right. right. However, if you subscribe to patreon.com slash everything elite, you get to hear the most life changing podcast. That's right. Well, we're going to talk about that more in just a minute. Let's, oh, uh, we got to finish this show. I know it would have been a great segue. 
But I'm great at segues. The show's I, over. I, it's done. We did I, it. So nobody wants to talk about Orange Cassidy coming out as a tremendous man. angle. Great angle. Tremendous. You got the black band-aid on his head. That was my favorite part. <laughs> I was glad <laughs> yeah. they told the, the blood orange beating. Yeah. That was good. He actually did look like he had a bruise or something. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that shit hurts. I bet it did. Anyway, he attacked Jericho. He was mad. Jericho left. It was good. I, right. I, I liked that Matt Hardy, who was on camera, he said, oh, he's trying. That was yeah. a great line. <laughs> Matt Hardy seems to be, like, actually invested in in AEW and what's going on. You, you know, like, now we're... He's trying, is what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we're actually, like, three months in to Matt Hardy and, and AEW. What's your impression now? Net like, positive, I would say. Net positive? Well, I, I think it's really hit or miss by each segment, his stuff. And sure. The, the stadium brawls has all been good, but then you get one of these in-ring segments that just dies a death. Yeah. So it's just, you know, I, I do like taking big swings and he does connect on some of them, but does whiff on some of them also. He, he, he is he the Aaron Dunn? Uh, Adam Dunn, sorry. Adam Dunn. Adam. Th- that's that my the, bad. Uh, no, it's Adam Duritz. He's the singer. <laughs> no, no, no. I, yeah, I, I see what he did there. That's a callback, and I appreciate it. But no, I'm talking about Adam <laughs> Dong, the three true outcomes baseball player that either would strike out, walk, or hit a home run. Uh, what is what's a walk in in this analogy? We neither delete or elite it. Hmm. Mm, a walk is like a. Uh. Like a MJF promo. Oh wow! Maybe you know, just when it's like, yeah, good heel promo. Hmm. Got on base. Hmm. I mean, a walk's basically a single, right? No, it is. It MJF is. Had, but it, when was the last it, time MJF hit a double? But it causes more pitches, so yeah, it can be more valuable than a single. Really. I, I, I would say his throne. His throne promo that he did, where they, they changed his seat and they had him like talk about how he was going to be the new king in his throne. I thought call that, that a double. I call that a double. Maybe a ground rule double. Maybe a pass ball advance to second right. base. Okay. Yeah, everybody knows I'm not that into MJF's promos. So yeah, that's fair. At this point, his matches are more interesting to me after that Jungle Boy match. Shit, that was yeah. re- that was really good. Yeah, that was right. Well, unfortunately, I blew the segue, but <laughs> while well, actively, again, to, to let you off the hook, I was actively trying to prevent it. True. So I do want to tell you, friends, I've got a I've got an interesting investment proposition for you. It's called patreon.com slash everything elite. You invest three, five or eight dollars and you get a huge return, folks. So three dollars, you get a weekly preview show from... Mike and me previewing Dynamite. Nate giving us literally all the vlog content. All we the watch, vlogs you could want and more. We watch Dark and the vlogs, so you don't have to. Uh, and you get one bonus show per month for your three bucks. For five bucks, you get everything I just talked about. Plus, you're going to get at least four bonus shows. It's You get a huge, get a huge amount of content. For your five bucks. Everybody's looking at me, but that's what happens because there's at least four weeks in every month. Yeah, we've never explicitly stated that because the idea was that we wouldn't have to hold ourselves to that. But we have for many months. So I mean I think <laughs> we have done it every we have done it on a weekly basis, but yeah. Now now we can't take a week off ever. Well, I've only said it for this month. I mean, I don't know. Okay, that's right. Yeah. For June, at least four bonus shots. Yeah. So anyway, last week we did off the rails, which we've been talking about, which included uh I, I don't know. Should I mean it it's hard to tease rails. it? It did. Yeah. I, I can't really explain the segment to you. You just have to go listen to it. But we also talked about the end of Evolve and something else at the end that I can't remember that uh that was fun. So go check that out. And next week, I'm not sure what we're gonna bring you yet. We're gonna bring you something good. For all no, that's not true. You got to be at least <laughs> I can't remember. Can everybody get in the Discord or just five dollar? Yeah. Everyone could be in the Discord, I thought. Even our three dollar patrons get in the discord i don't remember it's on the page though so when you go you'll find out <laughs> but come in the discord it's a lot of fun we're, we're eventually going to get nate in the discord i have uh i really believe in this people in the discord are asking for nate i don't know i kind of like having the outsider's perspective on it where i just sort of it, it it's developed better content me not being in there and just sort of having this uh well you don't you don't have to join us for the uh for the live shows you know but you know you might 
you might just come in occasionally, say hi to the fans, you know? Yeah. People were pitching uh, Patreon shows for you last night. Oh, yeah, the good one. Yeah. What do you uh, think about what do you think about this? Are you are, familiar? Wait, should I just say it or should I say what it's based off of, Mike? Uh, well, I mean, it kind of ties in together. If we say what it's based off of, he's no way that the name's gonna make obvious sense. Nate, yeah. it's called Nate is for you. No, just Nate for you. Nate for you. Yeah, okay. Nate for you. I I watched like two or three episodes of the television. Okay. Program. Okay. So basically, the idea that the that the patrons are pitching is that you will, you know talk about some of the wrestlers and pitch ways to fix them. Okay. I feel like you would thrive with this idea. Um, I could, uh, I could see finding some interesting, uh, <laughs> you know, angles on particular wrestlers. Now is the joke that all, all the ideas are bad. <laughs> I, I mean, the joke would be whatever your take is. I mean, the, well, the, the, the joke yeah, is that's that not a very name... nice thing to say about my takes, Mike. <laughs> no, I think you have some brilliance. I, I mean, we all have our hits and misses here, you know. Okay. But you, but you provide a different perspective I think is valuable and that our patrons enjoy. Okay, here's uh, here's one I'm going to share. This is, this is premium uh, Discord content, folks, from our good friend, Aaron Quinn. Aaron says, the problem, AEW has shitty themes and also a small women's division. The solution, this is an idols promotion now. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, sounds like Aaron's got it all right there. What do I need to do? Sounds like the job's done. I will say the Ricky Starks theme, a standout among yeah. the theme music in AEW. I like the horns coming in for it. Yeah, it had it had a unique sound in a way that a lot of the other themes have kind of gotten muddled together, I thought. But yeah, so, they want to bring in you know, some idols who can contribute both music and wrestling. I think that's uh, to everyone's benefit. Like the Up Up Girls, for example. The Up Up Girls. There's three right there. Maki Ito. Maki Ito. There's a fourth. Tom Nakano. Tom. Mm. Um, is was Iski? No, Iski was a member of Stardom Idol, so she was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Tall Saya. Is that Tall Saya? Tall Saya. Yeah. Zoom Tall Saya would also work. So yeah, there's lots of ones out there that they could yeah. they could bring in. So I I the uh, sure yeah, yeah. I have Ina. The difficulty is that <laughs> all these idols, all their music is done by like uh, you know production companies that write all the yeah. music and then write all the lyrics and then they just have them fuck perform now I'm, these. Yeah, now I'm thinking about Mikey Ruckus idol songs. I. <laughs> M- Mikey, I would love to hear you do like an idol song. I want to hear your version of Upkick. Yeah. So yeah, that does have a certain appeal. So if that sounds interesting to you, <laughs> uh, patreon.com slash everything elite. There's a lot of content. Okay. Next week on Dynamite, June 24th from Daly's Place, Sammy Guevara versus Matt Hardy, Brody Lee and Colt Cabana versus Sonny Kiss and Joey Janela. There's going to be a Lumberjack match, Wardlow versus Luchasaurus, FTR versus The Natural Nightmares, and John Moxley will be in action. Taz will be on commentary. Maybe Abaddon will beat John Moxley. I mean, she has a winning streak right now in the in these situations. Who's to say? Who's to say? Uh, so, did y'all catch what Sammy and Matt were doing for this over the last like twenty four hours? I did not. So no, Matt, Fighter Fest. No, no. What Sammy and Matt are doing for this match next week? Oh no. So they are. So Matt said, "Pick your poison. Which personality of mine that you want." And Sammy said he wants the original Matt Hardy. He wants the unkillable Matt Hardy. So it's going to be unkillable Matt Hardy versus Sammy Guevara. Is that then? That's the original. See again. I need a. I need a full digest of all these different. Uh, yeah, uh, you know what I could really use is like you know how there's like unit charts in Japan for like yes. what units are. I need to know like this, but for like affinities for each of the uh, multifarious faces of Hardy. Yeah, need a need a timeline that breaks them all down. Oh, it, absolutely. Gear moves they do music. I guess this is probably what should be like a this is episode for Matt Hardy, maybe. Welcome to the production meeting part of our episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean we can do that anytime. Uh, but I gotta say the whole the whole Patreon plug in general was kind of a disaster. <laughs> well, I'm a disaster. I mean, what can I say? There will be some more fun content coming to you each and every Monday of this month. That's right. And hey, like hopefully. other other <laughs> wrestling is starting soon, so hopefully yeah. we'll have like 
you know, yeah, had, yeah. had grand ideas like right before the died uh, before the uh, uh, quarantine of like, hey, there's a big AAA show coming up. Let's do that for the Patreon because it's got these AEW ties in tie-ins. Right, it just never panned out. But yeah, hopefully, I, I was thinking the other day we have this unused graphic. Yeah, for a show called Into the Cody Verse. Right. That I mean, that would have been for the AAA show. But what about that's Cody Verse? I, I was thinking about this. You know, there's an upcoming GCW show. Uh, there is an upcoming GCW show. Also, I just got my GCW merch today. Did you? Mm-hmm. So my I had a pen and some shorts. GCW shorts. That sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm one of these uh, bums who just wears basketball shorts around the house. So I think probably oh, yeah. most, most, uh, you know, guys of our age do that from time to time. Right. Yeah. I famously wore basketball <laughs> shorts out of the house. Yeah. Like two weekends ago. So can I always use another pair of those. Hey, yeah. I, right I got there. a pair of Miami hurricanes basketball shorts on right now. Nice. Beautiful. I've got at least one pair of those. Go Canes. Go Canes. Go Canes. Uh, Fighter Fest. A couple of new matches announced. We talked about Sheeta versus Penelope Ford. They literally build it as Cody versus Jake Hager, even though Cody presumably will have two more matches before that, or one more match before then. Whatever. And they announced Chris Jericho versus Orange Cassidy is official for Fighter Fest. I mean, is I, I want to ask you all a question. Do we think that they finally break a million again with Chris Jericho and Orange Cassidy, considering how those two have been viewed and have been noted as ratings drivers? Feels like maybe no. Okay. Kind of just feels like if we were going to pop a big number like that, then we would have more momentum showing up week after week where it's kind of inching up that way. And it doesn't really seem like that's happening. I don't know. I believe I predicted on the Patreon something like six months they wouldn't hit a million viewers. I can't remember, though. Uh, one other note. I think we hit all the other notes we listed here, but Chris Statlander and John Schuyler suffered especially bad knee injuries in the last week or so. Chris in that in the match on Dynamite last week and John Schuyler on the dark taping. So... And Skylar, it was like every ligament in his knee, wasn't it, that uh, that was torn up. So I uh, feel bad for both of those folks, especially John Skylar, who is not signed to an AW contract. But uh, hopefully they will take good care of him. Yeah, it was at least his ACL, MCL, and PCL. The only one I don't think he tore was his lateral. And he said it was six months, at least what they were thinking. I, I've not seen a time frame for Chris Statlander yet. Have y'all? No, but if that guy can come back from that in six months, I'd be shocked. I mean, that's he had like a Facebook post that went on that talked about it. And he was very complimentary about the uh, medical services that happened at the show. But I'm hoping that it carries on through his surgery and his rehabilitation. I hope that AEW does the right thing with someone who's not contracted. Agreed. All right. Anything else you guys want to chat about before we get out of here? No. Nah, I'm good. I started playing Fire Pro this week, finally. Yeah. Yeah, having a good time. Good. I don't actually think the gameplay of Fire Pro is that fun. It's like, it's one of those things that I feel like that it takes something to a certain aspect that like the more fun is like plotting out things. Like if you're someone who likes like Total Extreme Warfare, then you like playing Fire Pro because you could do the same things. I've got an AEW roster. I've got Dragon Gate roster. I've updated a lot of the New Japan and Stardom wrestlers that were already in on it. So Yeah. Fun. Yeah, it seems like the fun is like, getting your roster and doing your creative venue shit and stuff like that. But then like after you've done all that, then you have to like play the game. And then like, after sure. hours, I'm like, I have played the game now. I, I'm, I'm done playing the game. That's fair. Somebody said last week, they knew it was going to be good when we were wrapping up and there were still like <laughs> 10 minutes left in the file. I, I mean, don't I, I don't think I have 10 minutes of content on anything right now. No, we we went on a lot of digressions on this episode. So. Yeah, we went some places. Pretty high concept ones. Yes. Yeah. I'll close it out. So you can find us on Twitter at everything AEW. I'm at Aaron Like the Car. Nate is at Epitasis. Mike is at Fuji Heya. Please subscribe to the show. Give us a rating and review on the Apple Podcast app if you use that. And please check out patreon.com slash everything elite for bonus EE content. So for Mike, for Nate. 
I'm Aaron. We'll see you next time.